celebrating our 20th season. From the College by the Lake, meeting the personalities and discussing the issues that affect all of Court Lane and the Inland Northwest, we are the North Idaho College Public Forum. And now, here's your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today, our program deals with political developments in Europe. I particularly want to emphasize what has been going on in Germany now that it has uh, gone through reunification and other Eastern European countries. And our guest has also recently been to what was the Soviet Union and now uh, is within the Republic of Russia, where he visited. We're very happy to welcome to the program Richard Heyman, who is a journalist from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, he's also a freelance uh, writer, and uh, he's had a lot of experience with his recent travels, and he's here visiting uh, in North Idaho. And we're very happy to have him on the program. Richard, thank you for coming by and taking time to enlighten us on recent developments in Europe. Thank you, Tony, for inviting me. And I'm very pleased to have two members of the panel to question our guest today. First of all is Steve Schink, who is Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And next to him is Lloyd Marsh, who's on the faculty at North Idaho College teaching in the natural sciences. And I shall ask Steve Schink to commence the questioning. Richard, this isn't your first trip to uh, North Idaho or to Coeur d'Alene or even to this studio. Why don't you take just a minute, if you would please, and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background in this community. Well, I uh, came to North Idaho as an exchange student in, I believe it's 1980. And after my year at Coeur d'Alene High, I came back to NIC and uh, took part in the journalism program here. And uh, I just keep coming back ever <laughs> since for visit once a year or twice a year. Well, I can't miss the opportunity to, to uh, ask you a follow-up question on your, on your experience as a, as a student at North Idaho College, especially as that relates to what you're doing now. You went through both the, the uh, radio and television program that we had at that time and also through our print uh, uh, journalism program, and now you're a working journalist in Europe. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing, what you've been doing as a journalist? Well, um, I've been covering mostly uh, local events till about a year ago, and um, after the wall came down, I tried to take every opportunity that I could to um, report on matters concerning to what used to be East Germany and uh, also some other Eastern European countries. Um, I guess being uh, over here in the U.S. for quite a few years helped me to get into the different cultures, too, that people have in Eastern Europe. and. Uh, I guess it just made life easier in communicating with those people, even though I don't speak Russian or any other language there. Are you working as a print journalist or a broadcast journalist now? I'm working as a print journalist. And is it for a, a German magazine? It's or? Uh, for a weekly paper, which I guess is similar to a magazine over here. Lloyd Marsh. Well, I'd like to, to get into the situation in Germany now since the reunification. Um, First of all, is there free access now from east to west and west to east? And people that lived, formerly lived in the East Germany uh, have free access to the western side now? Oh, certainly. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have quite a few people from East Germany moving towards West Germany and looking for jobs there. The unemployment rate in East Germany at this point is, well, the official government uh, figures state about 20 to 25 percent. Yeah, yeah. The actual number is probably more around 50 yeah. percent. Uh, because a lot of people are actually being laid off work but still considered as being employed. Yes, and, and I would imagine that no one is seeking to go from west to east, or at least not too many people. Well, uh, not too many people, but of course uh, some uh, companies from West Germany that are setting up offices over in the east uh, usually take their own people with them, mm, uh, which is kind of bad because it doesn't really help uh, with mm. the unemployment situation in east Germany. Mm. Has there been any migration of people that formerly lived in the east or the west to the other side? In other words, if people that were displaced and ended up in West Germany want to go back to East Germany, where their roots, where they were born? Is well, for the most part, it's, uh, you just have people from the east coming to the west I at see. this point. I see. Yeah. Wendy, Tony. Uh, Richard, I have some questions that I've been following recently, and I know you have some opinions and concerns. Uh, all of Europe is changing, as we know, and, and, and in fact, uh, even beyond Europe, uh, with the Soviet, former Soviet Union straddling both Asia and Europe, with the fall or collapse of the communist system in the Soviet Union and the liberation of Eastern Europe and now the reunification of Germany, it is just really redrawing the political map of Europe and affects the whole world. Uh, in Germany, 
with the reunification uh, and with an experiment that's been, been very effective with the uh, democracy and multi-political party system since the end of World War II, uh, certainly East Germany is coming under that umbrella of, of that democratic process. But we read a lot about recently uh, growth of uh, the skinhead movement, the racist skinhead movement in Germany, like there's been a problem in this country. Uh, we also have seen some uh, neo-Nazi groups and individuals and in literature, even the connection between the United States, the uh, neo-Nazi movement, and in Germany. And with that background, would you enlighten our audience to uh, what is happening and what's your concern in relation to that particular issue in Germany at this time? Well, I guess um, the problem is with a lot of people losing their jobs. Uh, they become very upset, they become very angry, and uh, they just tend to follow whoever seems to be preaching an easy answer out of the problem. And uh, radical groups, I guess, seem to have the easy answer. Um, so, of course, you have a lot of young, discouraged East German people uh, who now tend to go to right-wing parties. Can uh, I interrupt to say, when you say young people, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Uh, how, how large is the movement? Well, I was just going to get to that. Um, I would figure you're talking about maybe five to 8,000 people. Uh, which seems to be a really small number, but on the other hand, uh, the total population of East Germany was only 16 to 17 million people. So it actually it's uh, you know, quite a large group. And of course you have um, also some normal kids who kind of follow into that, um, I don't know, if skinheads go out and uh, start to pick fights with minorities, you're going to have other uh, young people who are not skinheads also joining them in this cause. In relation to that, how is the general population responding to uh, this growing movement and violence by this youth group? Well, you have protests uh, rising for the most part in Western Germany. Uh, I guess the problem in East, or where the problem comes from in East Germany is uh, the East German government always proclaimed uh, internationalism. They would uh, bring guest workers in from Cuba, Angola, uh, Vietnam, uh, but they would just set them up in uh, houses uh, that were outside of the usual city limits, and there really was not much contact between the East German people and those foreign guest workers. And um, so to the average East German person, a foreigner is foreign. Uh, you know, they just see this guy has a different skin. Uh, he has habits that they don't have, and there's really no understanding between those two groups. But the counter movement, you say, is more in, in West it's Germany. It's more in West Germany. Okay, Steve Sheen. Richard, how international is Germany as a country? The the uh, unified, reunified Germany. I mean, are there large ethnic populations, non-European ethnic ethnic populations in the country? Well, West Germany. Uh, had foreign guest workers since about the 1950s. Um, we have quite a large group of Turkish people living in West Germany. We have a relatively large group of Italian and uh, Yugoslavian and Spanish people living there also. Now the uh, tensions between, I guess, the Germans and the foreigners uh, in West Germany were never even close to becoming as great as they are now in East Germany. As a journalist, um, you, you already mentioned uh, that, uh, uh, the, the, your estimate of the number of, of people involved in radical political groups in, in Germany is, a bit, is about 5,000. Uh, are they getting more attention in Germany? Uh, are they getting more attention uh, throughout the, the, the rest of the, of the Western world than you think the numbers justify? Well, it's a tough question. Uh, of course, whenever you report on the things that they're doing, it's uh, you know, in a way free, uh, free advertisement for them. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think the subject should be taken lightly and ignored completely. Uh, I think the reporting just you know, should be done in such a manner that it doesn't draw more people following that movement. I've got to ask one other question about journalism and then I'll, and I'll let the questioning pass along. Um, 
you've had an opportunity to work extensively in, in East Germany as part of your your uh, your work as a journalist. Um, free press, I, I I would imagine, is something that's pretty new to those to those people. Uh, have have you uh, have you found that in other areas where there's a little bit of culture shock due to the to the reunification? of the countries, or, or are, are East Germans uh, very accepting of the, of the Western lifestyle that's been opened up since the wall came down? Well, I would say they, uh, in the beginning, they just adopted everything. Uh, whatever was, whatever came in from the West uh, was good. Uh, it got to the point that they would not buy any products that were made in East Germany, which then again, you know, caused even more unemployment there. Uh, in the last couple of months, uh, this has kind of changed. The East Germans now, uh, I guess, try to look out when they go to a store that they would buy more products that are actually made in East Germany. Um, there's this awareness now that not everything that comes in from the West is really as good as it you know, looked in the first place. Mm. Lloyd Marsh. Uh, I'm interested. You uh, have traveled recently in the former Soviet Union, I understand, and uh, is, is Germany, West Germany, because they have the wherewithal to get there, are they taking an active role in the conversion of some of the former Soviet republics and now as they evolve into a capitalist society? Is Germany very active in this role? Well, um, basically what we're doing, we are uh, supporting uh, yeah, the former Soviet Union financially to a uh, relatively large extent. Um, what our paper did in particular was a food drive up to a city called Viborg, which is north of Leningrad. Um, we packed, I guess, three uh, cargo containers full of food and medical supplies and uh, brought them in there in December. And uh, what was kind of an interesting observation as we uh, crossed from Finland into Russia was about a 60 to 70 mile drive and along that road you saw about every five minutes a Soviet army truck that was broken down uh, just laying there and some soldiers were out there trying to salvage parts. Um, my understanding is that uh, basically there's enough food available in the former Soviet Union, but the problem is they don't have any means of transportation in getting it from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of have uh, double thoughts of whether we are really helping the people over there by bringing food. Um, the more food we bring in, the less their farmers will actually uh, be able to sell. Um, I think the answer would rather be uh, giving them their own means to transport their own foods from one point to the other. Mm. Yes, and, and that sort of prompts the next question is uh, establishing the infrastructure uh, to run a country in a capitalist environment. Uh, I would think that West Germany has a lot of experience. They were very successful as a capitalist society. And do, do you see the West German business people getting in and establishing the infrastructure in the former Soviet Union? Well. At this point, we uh, still have quite a few difficulties in installing uh, the infrastructure into East Germany. Mm. Um, people have been thinking along bureaucratic lines for 40 years in East Germany, which makes it very difficult to re basically retrain them now into our kind of thinking. Now, in Russia, uh, it has not been 40 years, but 70 to 80 yeah. years, and that makes the problem that much more difficult. Now, on top of that, um, and I guess it doesn't make a difference whether it's a German or an American or a British person coming in, but everybody uh, from Western countries, uh, you know, were considered enemies for quite a long time, and um, you know, those people have to rethink too now that you know who used to be your foe is now your friend. Okay. Now, you know, they have some problems dealing with that too. Tony, Richard, another place that you've been visiting is a number of the Eastern European countries such as Poland and um, Czechoslovakia and others. Are the conditions actually economically better there as they're going through the transition than in what was the Soviet Union? What did you find on your visit? Well, uh, conditions are uh, relatively fair in Poland uh, just because Poland is on its way to capitalism for about 10 years now mm -hmm. and uh, to the most part the people there have kind of found their own niche in 
setting up little businesses, uh, dealing and wheeling and getting foreign currencies in that way. Um, a lot of Polish people uh, will buy goods in Russia and then bring them into Germany or Czechoslovakia and sell them there. Uh, Czechoslovakia has a pretty good chance too of making it. Um, people there have some money and um, also have already established relatively good business connections to Western Europe. Uh, the problem for Czechoslovakia is more uh, what you see happening in Yugoslavia now. You have two ethnic groups in there and uh, both are trying to well, or, or in both groups, you have radicals who are preaching that they should set up their own country, and that could be quite disastrous. Mm -hmm. in, in relation to that, the United States, there's a lot of businesses here, and, and in fact, we did a show with some individuals on a really exciting concept they have of a magazine that's directed at Eastern Europe and trying to teach capitalism and also trade. Uh, is Germany, the reunified Germany, uh, focusing a lot of attention on opening up trade with all Eastern Europe? Oh, certainly. Um, again, I think the problem is, uh, especially in Russia, you still have people running what is, they're still a state-owned business uh, who have been bureaucrats for the last centuries. Most of them are relatively old. I guess the average age of a Russian manager is about uh, in its late 50s at this point. And uh, those people, of course, were trained to think along socialistic lines for all these years, uh, which makes it very hard for them to rethink now. And um, well, there have been complaints that a lot of them uh, are still uh, holding on to communist ideas and uh, don't really have any changes in mind. Steve yeah. Sheen. Richard, it's interesting to me to reflect on what's going on on the one hand in, in Western Europe and what's going on in the, in the old Soviet Union and, and um, uh, the Eastern, what used to be the Eastern Bloc countries. It seems to me that, that uh, Western Europe is moving more and more toward, um, um, and, and, I, and I'm probably jumping ahead here to, to suggest that we're going to break down national barriers, but there's talk of a, of a common currency. Uh, certainly, the economic the European economic community is, is is growing in strength. There's a tunnel that joins mm. uh, rail and automobile tunnel that joins England and France. On the other hand, it seems that uh, in the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, certainly, and, and even in some of the Eastern Bloc countries, that uh, there's a danger, if you want to look at it that way, that uh, that those, those what were those nations are going to break into smaller and smaller geographic and ethnic groups. What do you see happening there, is it, and is it good or bad, that, that, that breakup? And what do you see happening, on, on, the other, on the other hand, in, in Western Europe, where people are, seem to be moving closer and closer together? Well, I guess um, the difference is uh, what's happening in Western Europe is a decision that is made by all the people involved, and everybody wants to move into the common market. Uh, what was happening in the, Soviet, in the former Soviet Union was that a uh, centralized government uh, sat in Moscow and said, we're all one nation now. And those people were forced to become Soviet Union citizens. Yeah. Um, now, with the government losing their power, uh, they just want to get back, or they feel the freedom to get back to their own uh, nationalistic ideas and just uh, live this way now. Um, of course, there's a great danger uh, that smaller scale wars that are happening now, uh, now between Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, could turn into something bigger. Uh, also, um, a lot of those countries in the former Soviet Union still have a hold of at least tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know at this point if uh, not some of those people in power there would or might use them, actually. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a shaky situation. Uh, it, it must be very interesting for you and your country to take a look at what's going on there and try to say, well, yes, on the one hand, we see a breakup of the monolithic Soviet Union as a good thing, but how far do we, do we want this break 
up to go before it becomes a breakdown and is destabilizing. Is, is there some ambiguity uh, in the German government about just how do we deal with the events that are going on uh, next door? Well, I don't think uh, it's only in the German government. I think it's uh, all over Europe. Uh, more and more politicians are beginning to think that what is happening in the former Soviet Union just happened too fast. Um, and on the other hand, the problem is, uh, like in Russia and the Ukraine, uh, prices were opened up, but at the same time a capitalistic system was not installed. So uh, people are just not able anymore for their monthly pay to actually buy food. Is, is there, in your opinion, a, a widespread agreement on the need for humanitarian aid on the one hand, but, but maybe some disagreement on the best way to, to react politically to what's going on? Well, the humanitarian aid uh, has its drawbacks too. Um, like I said before, by just uh, bringing food over and handing it out for free, uh, you take away the means for any uh, Russian farmer to actually earn his own pay. And you know, once people get used to uh, having food for free, they're not ever going to go and buy something. <laughs> Lloyd Marsh. Yeah, I'd like to bring this down to a little more personal basis. When you were traveling in the former Soviet Union, that part of the world, were you working at that time? Were you a working journalist and sending back reports or stories or items to your paper? Yeah, right. And uh, what nature did they have? Were they general interest or factual? I mean, what? how did... Oh, it was, I guess, a little bit about everything. Um, there were reports about just uh, personal talks to people on the street, mm -hmm. uh, also about the overall situation in certain cities, and um, some were interviews with uh, local government officials. Yeah. What an interesting way to go. Tony. I would like to ask you, Richard, now that you've had that uh, exposure, and of course you grew up in Germany, and you have uh, an awful lot of knowledge about the whole uh, process and, and, and a lot of formal education. I'm going to ask you to try to be visionary and tell us what you think may happen. I know this, that no one has a crystal ball, but with, with so much going on at once, with the uh, developments of 1992, such a key year with the European Parliament and so forth that you've already mentioned and, and the other things you're talking about, who's going to rise to be the greatest influence? Is it the European Parliament? Is it going to be Germany? And um, is, there a, is there a possibility that because of the great economic crisis in the former Soviet Union that a dictator will rise there again? Now, this is that's a, lot of, a lot on the plate, but uh, what are some of your predictions? Well, I don't think uh, Germany will uh, play the major role just because financially we wouldn't be able to do that at this point. Um, we're spending billions of uh, dollars every year right now just to get the infrastructure up in East Germany. We're also uh, spending billions of dollars to uh, help Russia. Um, I would say uh, probably that the uh, European Parliament will grow stronger and stronger over the years to come. And uh, in 20 years, you probably will be more dealing with a European nation uh, rather than with small your French, German, British, Dutch nations over there. Now what's going to happen in uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, I don't think anybody uh, would be able to tell at this point. You could have a dictator rising up just as you could have a lot of small nations. It's just very delicate at this point and very crucial. Do you think Germany will remain in uh, the European Parliament common market or, or as you become reunified and, and once you get your infrastructure in place and so forth and your economic strong, do you think Germany would be tempted to go its own course? Well, I think Germany uh, could just profit from being in the European common market. Um, the one nation where I would say they might drop out would be England. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still some hesitation there. There's been more opposition there than in right. other countries, hasn't there? Another thing we hear so much about, and you might have picked up on this with some of your interviews, th and, and Steve was just very articulate in pointing out that the breakup could be uh, so decentralized that there'd be uh, instability in all of Europe. But one thing that really concerns us in the United States is that there are nuclear weapons with the, with the delivery systems in four of the republics, and as they become independent countries, we could be dealing with four different countries with this nuclear potential, uh, you know, th that real struggle now where it's going to be under central uh, control. Uh, what are you hearing about that? Is, uh, uh, and I know that our government and 
our Secretary of State and others have been very involved in trying to encourage a, a, a central control. Otherwise, that's an unusual way of having proliferation of nuclear weapons. Well, it's not only um, those four states that you just mentioned, but you have uh, furthermore four other states who uh, are still in control of tactical nuclear weapons, uh, which makes, at least uh, for a European, the danger even greater. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you just look at how the Ukraine and Russia were fighting over uh, the before Soviet fleet in the Black Sea, uh, kind of gives you an idea uh, what could come out of that. I don't know if, um, you know if all the conflicts are going to be settled peacefully or not. You can only hope for that. Another precious the United States is that we've spent so much uh, in our struggle with the Soviet Union on military uh, hardware that our infrastructure, for example, our domestic problems have really increased and there's great pressure from the American people to spend more at home. Uh, for our economic stability. And one way to do that is to bring home uh, military uh, troops from Europe. And there's a very strong argument that they're not needed there now because the Warsaw Pact is gone uh, the, all, with all the collapse. And that may happen. If that happens, what will that do to countries like Germany that economically have been affected very much by our locating uh, a lot of forces in, in that particular country? Well, it would certainly mean for the merchants that are uh, living in the area where you have the American troop stations, uh, quite a few losses of money, of income. Um, and also it would probably mean for uh, the German government, but also for the British and French government, uh, some extra spending. Uh, for one thing, uh, to help the people living in those areas. A lot of people are employed by uh, right. being there. Also, would you have to spend some more money on military? Uh, defense? Uh, well, I don't really think so, um, but uh, some other people might see that there would be a need for that. So I guess we can conclude the program with, you've, you've, you've articulated all these issues so well, Richard, but uh, we all are in that waiting period to see what's going to happen. It's, it's been one of the, maybe the most rapid changes in history without uh, a major war. Uh, and thank you for being with us. You've been generous with your time, and I thank the panel for their questions. And Ladies and gentlemen, I know you found this a very, very important topic, and we all will have to watch in the future to see what uh, develops and it affects all the world, what is happening in Europe. I would like to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time, and we will discuss what we consider a significant issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.